You may have noticed in the bulletin the last couple of weeks that we've had articles on fellowship, and right now there will be one other article in the next uh, bulletin, I believe, and it will deal with fellowship. And I want to speak to you today regarding the importance of scriptural fellowship to the New Testament church. By way of introduction, let me point out, as you well know, that poor communication has been the plague of mankind since the confusion of man's language is at the great Tower of Babel. Evidence of miscommunication and misunderstanding is seen, I think, in the following comment. I know you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. Now, personally, I think a great many uh, discussions go along in that way. So it's no wonder that Jesus declared of us, in view of the way he made us, to come to the knowledge of anything. Take heed what you hear, Mark 4, 24. You know, that's my responsibility as a hearer. And then he said, take heed how you hear, Luke 8, 18. Am I hearing the true word of God? Am I understanding and applying it to my life and conducting myself accordingly? Now, if you don't take heed what you hear and how you hear, you'll be left out in the cold when it comes to learning much of anything, but especially when it comes to the gospel, God's power to save us, and all the component parts thereof concerning the church and living the Christian life. Now, we can sometimes be misunderstood. Husbands and wives get into it either lightly or otherwise because of misunderstandings brought about by even mispronunciations that's happened on the job the government so on or sound alike words a child was asked to draw a picture depicting the great hymn gladly the cross I'd bear instead the child drew a picture of gladly the cross I'd bear now if you didn't get the difference in that then that shows you even further how there's misunderstanding. <laughs> if we have problems understanding the concept of each other and trying to talk to one another so we can be understood by the other, what do you think about the problems that can develop in our attempts to understand God's Word? For His thoughts are not our thoughts. They are foreign to us. But God expects each one of us to understand Him well enough, at least, to learn the truth about our spiritual needs and how to, how to remedy those needs as we study God's Word, which He has given us for that purpose. When the Lord said, Ask, seek, and knock, and it shall be given, the present tense Greek verbs meaning keep on doing it, never stop, and you're going to find it. That's a guarantee. When you have an good and honest heart, Luke 8, 15, then that's what's going to drive you to ask and to knock and to seek and so on. And we're told, as Paul told Timothy, a man who already knew something could preach the gospel, study to show thyself to prove unto God, and the workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right the divine word of truth. And how many other teachings in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, emphasize that God's made you to understand and he's spoken to you so you can understand. But not if you don't do your part as a good student. I've said this often. You may not remember it, but over the years I've said it many times. One of the best college courses I ever had since my, one of my minors is in, in uh, speech was a listening comprehension course. If you, if you have a, an opportunity to ever take a course teaching you how to listen, take it. Now, they define listening. There's your definition automatically. It's understanding it so well that in your own words, you can tell it back to the person who is teaching you. That's when you know you know it. That's when you know you understand it. There's a lot of other things that help us, as we say in the general colloquial term, pay attention. God has done his part to perfection and knows how to communicate with mankind, who is his creature as well as telling us our own duty, our personal duty, to find Him and how to do it. 
Remember what we find in the common passage to all of us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That means spiritually complete. Thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Then Jesus himself said in John 8, 31 and 32, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. Disciples are learner, you see. Then are you my disciples. But watch, it's indeed in the way that you conduct yourself. And, watch the final product of that. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Obviously, God's done for us what we never could do for ourselves. And he knows how to talk to us, for he made us, and knows how he made us to understand, and he knows how to talk to us. He knows how to inform us. But we have a will. And we must know ourselves well enough to know how to study his will and to understand what he said. And of course, I've quoted Colossians 3.17 that makes it very clear he expects us to do that. And he doesn't expect out of us what we cannot do. So one such concept that sometimes is especially warped in its biblical meaning is the concept of Christian fellowship. Today, people call about anything Christians do together fellowship. We have fellowship rooms, we have fellowship halls, we have fellowship meals, we have senior fellowship, we have youth fellowship, we have this, that, or the other fellowship. And I think a lot of people use those words, they have no idea what the Lord meant by fellowship. All you have to do is ask yourself, sit down, just take a piece of paper. <laughs> fellowship, here's what the Bible teaches about it. Here's my understanding of it. Be that as it may, for each Christian who and each congregation of God's people that seeks to be faithful to Christ in every way, to be guided in precept and practice only by the New Testament of the Christ, fellowship then is very important. You know, the first letter... John wrote, it's fundamentally all about fellowship between Christians. But you know, it begins with fellowship between God. How many times have we talked about, if you're going to study the fellowship existent between brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, the church, you have to first understand how they got into the church. And they had to be qualified spiritually to get into the church. And who put them into the church? So fellowship first is vertical between the individual and God. Only after one has heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel of Christ and being baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ, Galatians 3.27, can one be concerned then with the horizontal, his fellowship with his brothers and sisters in Christ. And if this is not right, the vertical relationship between God and man then this is not right. And that needs to be kept in mind. That's why that we plead with people all the time to make sure your life is right with God. Make sure you're a child of God. And all that the Bible, especially the New Testament, defines a child of God to be. So in our study of New Testament fellowship, a man with God, and then man with man, I think we'll have a better understanding of God's great plan for his will to be carried out by the church. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. We'll be coming back to it later of his will to be carried out by the church, the saved. So it's in order for us to understand how God has chosen to do his will through the church. Thus, we must first discover what true New Testament Christian fellowship actually is. And second, why? Underscore the word why. Why fellowship is important in a New Testament church, a congregation of God's people, the family of God. How each one of us can practice the fellowship that Jesus expects his church, purchased by his blood, built by him to practice, and to not engage in a fellowship that is not taught in the New Testament of Christ. You see, Colossians 3.17 impacts fellowship just like it does baptism or belief, whatever else, spiritually. Now, let's look for a little while, because this is a very general study to get the basis well laid. It'll be repetitive to some of you. That won't hurt anybody at all. The biblical meaning of fellowship. 
specifically what the New Testament teaches. Now let me read to you first of all before we get into these things. Just what John said is the Holy Spirit inspired the apostle in writing part of the New Testament of the Christ. He's writing to Christians. Remember that. They heard the same gospel we heard. They obeyed that gospel from the heart just like we did. The Lord added them to his church, the spiritual body of Christ, just like he added us. You see, their understanding was enlightened by the understanding of what they took heed to. And John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Parenthetically sets in then, for the life was manifested, made known, revealed, and we have seen it. And bear witness. Understand here what a witness is. And show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Then he comes back to his main thing. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Now here's the reason. That ye also may have fellowship with us. The us here is the apostles folks. They're the witnesses for Jesus. And what he's saying here is that all those who never saw the Lord with their eyes. Who never heard him with their ears. Who never touched him. We want you and God wants you to have the same kind of fellowship with him that we, who associated with him physically, have with him as apostles of Christ. That ye also may have fellowship with us. Now watch. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I may say you can't be in fellowship with the Father and not be, and not be in fellowship with his Son. And you cannot be in fellowship with with Jesus Christ, his son, and not be in fellowship with the Father. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then he goes on and says, This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness. Notice how immediately he turns to truth is that which is the only thing to lead God and direct us to God and in living the Christian life. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Remember what Jesus said about the truth? And it was John who recorded those words of Jesus in John 8, 31 and 32. Then notice, but if we, we Christians, we heard the gospel from the heart, obeyed it, were baptized into Christ, Walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And the Greek present tense is toward the end means the blood you contacted that remitted your old and alien sins continues to wash you from sin as you walk in the light as he is in the light. Now I spent some time a while back showing you the meaning of what it is to walk in the light as he is in the light. On the day the church started, Luke records my inspiration. In Acts 2.42, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now let me ask you something. Why did the church continue steadfastly in the apostles, the apostles of Christ's doctrine? Because they were ambassadors of the court of heaven, and by the Holy Spirit, Jesus ruling in heaven at the right hand of God was revealing the New Testament of Jesus Christ. The early church understood that. So when they followed the teachings of the apostles of Christ, they were following Jesus Christ. You see, to be faithful today, we do the same thing. While theirs was inspiration or the Holy Spirit in a man guiding him, ours has been transferred to the Word, the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. We're to preach the Word. You heard that in the last song we sang. Because the Word reveals how one comes into fellowship with God. How one's sins are remitted. And when it's remitted. And how, what it is then to be a Christian. How do I know anything about being a Christian? To become a Christian and live the Christian life. How do I know anything about fellowship? If I don't study my Bible. If I'm ignorant of it. So if we say that we have no sin. We deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. If we understand Romans 6. We should understand that passage. 
Romans 6, Paul rebukes the church at Rome. They'd heard the same gospel that we heard, believed and obeyed it. He goes back over with them in Romans 6. What they heard, believed and obeyed that made them Christians. And he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now what's the point? Because we all make mistakes. We all sin from time to time. But listen to me. We do not purposely and habitually sin and we don't want to and we work every day of our lives not to. That's what it is to walk in the apostles' teaching. That's though why we cannot say, well, I don't sin at all. I never sin. Now what does the Bible say about a person who says that? You're a liar. The truth's not in you. You see, you need the cleansing power of the blood of Christ, which blood you contacted in the waters of baptism, having first believed in him based on the word, repented of your sins, Acts 17.30, and confessed your faith in him, thus being qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins. He had you to the church. You were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, and we're called a new creature in Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. What's new about it? I remember when I was baptized a long time ago now. You know, the same physical body that was dry when he went into the water and was put under the water and came up out of the water, a wet physical body. That's all the difference there was in the physical body. But the Bible says if I obey from the heart, the inward man, I'm a new creature. Well, you couldn't tell it by looking at my body. I remember one time we worked with the Vietnamese long years ago when Vietnam fell at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. There was a major who came to our studies, and I was teaching every day the Vietnamese in the chapel out there, Monday through Friday. And they would come in and out, and some would stay and study. And this fellow wanted to be baptized after quite a bit of a while. Well, you had to go through jumping all sorts of hoops to get to the swimming pool where we could baptize him. But we did. And we baptized him, and we were riding in a Jeep. And he was sitting in the back, I was sitting in the front, and there was the driver. We drove back to the barracks where his family was. They were all out on that little bitty porch. And when he saw them all out there looking at him coming, he looked at me and he said, they want to see if there's anything different about me. Well, you can't see it. Not with the physical eye on the physical body. Except in what the person did when he willed to go down into the water for a given reason. That taught he was understanding what he was doing, didn't it? But the change is in the mind. The change is in the heart. I will no longer practice sin. I will from henceforth do all my Lord tells me. And that I grow in the grace and knowledge of God. Whatever I find is contrary to the Lord's will, I'm going to give it up and do things God's way. That's exactly what's involved. That's what John's talking about. That kind of person, the blood you contacted in the watery grave of baptism, will continue to be washed clean because he's pressing on. You know, we sing a song like that. About the upward way. That's what we're singing. New heights I'm gaining every day. Did you not know what you were singing? Why do you say new heights you're gaining every day? Because you're laboring to know the truth. So there's a big difference in a person who's ignorant of something, but doing all they can by the powers God gave them to learn. But seek you first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things should be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. And in the person who knows but won't do, or is satisfied with the little he does know, and rebels against anything that tries to show him that he needs to improve. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In the Lord, wherein are all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1, 3. And when you were baptized into Christ, one of those great spiritual blessings was to be in full fellowship with God. One with God. And with everybody else who did the same thing as they live a new creature in Christ. Being directed by the perfect law of liberty and every thought, word, and action, and willing to change when they see they're wrong. That's faithfulness, brethren. That's faithfulness because no man is flawless. We need to understand that when it comes into what we're talking about. Now, so we need to discover the New Testament Christian and what fellowship is to him. Also, why fellowship is important in a New Testament church. And finally, how each one of us can practice the fellowship 
that Jesus expects his church to practice and not engage in a fellowship that is not taught in the New Testament of Christ and therefore constitutes sin, for sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. So as we have this first chapter of John, he says, I wrote to you so you'll understand these things. So you'll be in the same fellowship with God that we, the apostles of Christ, have, and that you'll know so. So you have the attitude of verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Folks, don't you know that's more than just a specific sin or sins you may commit? That's a disposition of heart that says, I can certainly do that and I know I'm not perfect. So I must drive myself on to greater desire to know and do the truth. That I can remain in fellowship with God. Which in being baptized into Christ, I obtained. Through my sins being washed away by the blood of Christ. It's very important to understand that. So for a little while, the time remaining, consider the biblical meaning of fellowship. We may not get through with all of it, but we're going to begin. In an examination of the Koine Greek of the New Testament regarding our English word, fellowship, you'll discover that there are at least, there could be more, but that there are at least seven facts that aid us in understanding what God means by the fellowship existent in the church between brothers and sisters in Christ that did not exist when they were outside the church still living in their alien sins. First of all, the fact concerns the meaning of the Greek word itself. Our English word fellowship is the translation of the Greek word koinonia. And this Greek word is derived from koinos, which was a prefix in the ancient Greek. And if you were to add this prefix to other words, such as, let's say, living, owning a purse, a dispute, and mother, you'd get words like this, living in community together, owning a purse in common. Think of a bank account. You have a bank account in common. Or a public dispute. In other words, it goes beyond the individual and involves other people. Uh, and having a mother in common. So we see that the root of the word fellowship means simply to hold something in common. And may bring that over to the family of God. We as brothers and sisters in Christ, out of all the rest of the world, have something in common that nobody else has. That within itself ought to make us realize the great importance of spiritual fellowship in the family of God, the church. Our second fact relates to the usage of the word fellowship. This word koinonia was used to describe, in its com remember common Greek means the common Greek used among the common people in their everyday conversations and communication in the first century world. So the word koinonia was used to describe Corporations, as they were then, uh, labor guilds, partners in a law firm. Oh, and yes, the most intimate relationship, marriage, husband and wife. Now, from the usage of this word, we can conclude that fellowship is a word denoting a relationship that is dependent on more than one individual. You know what that's being to dawn on me? My life in the church is strongly dependent upon you and you on me. As the Bible leads, guides, and directs us in living the Christian life. God meant it that way. No Christian is an island to himself. That's the reason you begin to see fellowship in God's mind for his children in his church is so very important. We'll see more of that, I hope, as we go along. Time, allow. Time allows us to. Now, uh, I may bring this up to emphasize further. If you can understand the fellowship between a husband and a wife, then you ought to be able to see the importance of fellowship among the brethren in the Lord's church. A third fact is that fellowship was never used to describe man's relationship to God until... The church of our Lord was established 
on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ as Luke records it in Acts chapter 2. That's interesting. Can you guess why? If you know your New Testament, you ought to. It's in the church that man is fully and completely reconciled to God because his sins are forgiven. Only in that church can fellowship exist. That's the reason you don't compromise the truth. That's the reason faithful Christians will get upset at the compromising of the truth regarding the church and all things pertaining to it. The plan of salvation, of course. Being the only way one becomes a Christian when a person believes and obeys it. A fourth fact about the meaning of fellowship, and it takes a little time to do this, but is, uh, is found in comparing and, I guess you could say, in the effort put forth, the gleaning of comparing of New Testament synonyms. These are words which have overlapping, but not the identical meaning of the Greek word koinonia. The four synonyms of koinonia in the New Testament of the Christ are philos, which means related by love for outward characteristics. Heteros, meaning a sharer in a common enterprise. Sunergos, meaning a fellow worker. And metokos, a participant. Now think about being brothers and sisters in the family of God because you've been reconciled to God. And then think of those different words that describe your fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And every bit of it is based upon your adherence to the strict New Testament teaching of the Bible on becoming a Christian and being faithful as a Christian in the Lord's church. These things will not obtain unless a person from the heart is obedient to the gospel, Romans 6, 17, and 18, and is faithful to all those things pertaining to living the Christian life. Each of these words denotes a unity, a oneness, which is expressed in our bodies outwardly, but coming from one's individual faith and obedience to the gospel of Christ in order to be saved from one's alien sins, the sins we committed that separated us from God, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. You can see it in the scriptures. Paul writes this about the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. Now listen to him in view of what we've said. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. You were called into fellowship with His Son. Now re reckon what called us into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. It's the gospel. It's the gospel call. Why would it be the thing? Why, it's the power God has to save us. He's located all of divine power to save a man from his sins in the glad tidings of Christ, the gospel. Does that tell you now why it must be by the church preached to every creature? And that's the charge we have. That's part of our work. Now it's going to begin to dawn upon us why this fellowship must be as God wants it in the church between brothers and sisters in Christ, members of the body of Christ, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That work can't be done if we're not in fellowship one with another like it ought to be. It just can't be done. See, God, in setting up the whole scheme of redemption, how man's going to heaven, intended there to be fellowship, cooperation, sharing, partnership, working together. Fifth, we also must note that fellowship does not stop it does not stop with our own knowledge of our salvation. Now this is a point that sometimes we really miss. Because fellowship is primarily an action word. Cornelia is used 19 times in the New Testament. And in addition to being translated as fellowship, listen. It is also translated by words contribution, sharing, and participation. Action words. A close study of the, of the usage of this word tells us, informs us, guides us, enlightens us that action is always including in its meaning. Fellowship is not just being together. You see, you can be together in this auditorium and that doesn't mean you're in, fel in fellowship the way we defined it from the New Testament with everybody else. Fellowship is doing or acting are working together in the very plan of salvation. 
Man is doing what God requires of him. But what's God doing when he obeys the gospel from the heart? Romans 6, 17 and 18. Jesus adds him to the church because God forgives him of his sins. There's action on both parts. I fear greatly that this is a fundamental point regarding fellowship that many in the Lord's church for generations have not grasped. Thus, our sixth observation concerning the meaning of fellowship is that it is a unique relationship with Christ. Only the church of our Lord has it. He meant it that way. We have a relationship with each other because we are in Christ. Now, who put us there? And how did he do it? Well, we're baptized into Christ when we're baptized. For, unto, in order to, the remission, forgiveness of our sins. Galatians 3, 26, 27, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, and so on. Now, in the same way, we also have a relationship of being a part, a member of Christ's spiritual body. Fellowship is not being in or being part, but because we are in, and a part, we are doing what God teaches in the Bible that He expects if we're to be faithful to Christ, what we ought to do. It's our partnership with Christ in fulfilling His will. And all of it involves doing. Does that help you understand James 2 better? The faith apart from works is dead. And he's writing that to Christians. Remember that. He's writing that to Christians. Our final observation on this point may be gleaned from the last one. And it is this. Fellowship is not just doing anything together. Remember what we said about fellowship this and fellowship that. Fellowship meals and whatever. Our fellowship with others is only as good as our fellowship with Christ. And we can only participate with him in doing God's will. For that is all Jesus Christ ever does. Did you get that? All Jesus Christ ever does is his Father's will. And so he would say even in the flesh, I do always those things that please thee. My meat or my food is to do the Father's will. What do you think he thinks about us who have obeyed his gospel to become free from sin? He's added us to his church, the spiritual body. Do you think that kind of indicates, sort of indicates, that we're to be busy about things in the kingdom of the Lord before we're busy about anything else? For this reason, then we must quit thinking of Christian fellowship as primarily doing things such as having potluck dinners or watching football together or playing basketball together or hunting together or shooting guns together. (laughs) Oh, that's all well and good, and I'd certainly want to do that with brethren in Christ because of what we are. But that's not all that the Bible teaches. It doesn't hit the basic idea of fellowship. These have their place, but they're only fellowship to the extent that rest or exercise and eating or doing the work of the Lord. Fellowship involves actively doing God's will. Does that not tell you when the church withdraws fellowship from a person who will not repent of a sin? Does that tell you then what is specifically being withdrawn from him? It's that which is peculiar to Christian conduct and only is among Christians. The things we usually think of as fellowship are certainly not the primary meaning of the word. And I want that before I want anything else. Of course, if we're faithful to God in the church, we want to do these things together. I'm not trying to speak against them. I'm just saying let's make sure we know what Jesus in his New Testament says the primary meaning of fellowship really is. And not just look out here at the pavilion over it, the externals. We need to know what the real thing is. With these seven observations before us, we should be able to give a biblical definition of the word fellowship. Now listen here, and we'll have to close at this point. We, We can say fellowship is a relationship of each member of the Lord's church. That expresses itself, listen, in co-participation with Christ and one another in accomplishing God's will on earth. That's real fundamental fellowship between the among Christians. I want you to see this expressed and maybe we'll appreciate some songs a little more that are old to us. Do you remember the songs we have often sung, I have from my youth up and heard before I ever knew 
hard of what words were. We'll work till Jesus comes. Work for the night is coming. I want to be a worker for the Lord. Do the work. And you can go on and on. Hardly, uh, even when songs don't have that to it, you see activity of Christians and doing God's will. Now, we close the lesson by saying, watch, watch. Who is to spread the gospel to every creature, though God would have all men saved? The church. You see the fellowship between the family of God, the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom, and God in saving the souls of mankind? That is amazing to me. That he would commit to this body of people who believed and from the heart obeyed the gospel and are in fellowship with him and now in fellowship with everybody else did the same thing. He would commit that when he would have all men to be saved. And yet make us part of how that power to save gets out to all those that need it. Does not mean more to us now when we hear the Lord saying, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's us. God wants all men to be saved, but they're saved through the gospel. Who's charge of preaching the gospel? Then what about the body of Christ living faithful? Look at the organization of the church. When it's fully organized, there are elders who have certain qualifications to meet that basically says they're very mature Christians. They understand these things. Deacons to serve, preachers to preach, teachers to teach, members. They're all using their talents, their several abilities to preserve this fellowship that they came to know when they were baptized to Christ for the remission of sins and added to that church by the Lord. And this is what we need to know about fellowship that we are working together to do God's will as a partner, a sharer in fellowship with God. And that begins to open some eyes, I hope, to the importance a fellowship. The more I want to say, this is just the beginning. I tried to be as fundamental as I could. But I think sometimes some of us have been in the church a long time and never really understood what real, genuine, fundamental fellowship is. God can't get the work done. He wants done, though God is so far above our comprehension because he's charged the church to carry out his will in preaching the gospel to every creature and to keep themselves unspotted from the world. To remain pure. To stay in fellowship with God. So they can be in fellowship with one another. So there can be a unity and a oneness. All doing his part. A place for everything. Everything in its place. Decently and in order. That the will of God is done on earth. Remove the church from the earth. And God can't get his will done like he intends. There's a reason for the church folks. It's not just the same. Is to say that while they're on earth are to help God do what he wants. And that should be first, foremost, and always on our mind. Matthew 6, 33. If you're not a child of God this morning, know that that's what you're about to do. If you really become a child of God, the Bible defines it. Believing, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, and being baptized into Christ. Sins are remitted. You're in fellowship with God. Now you can be in fellowship with everybody else who's faithful in the church. You're in the church where all spiritual blessings are. If as a child of God, you've done those things contrary to God's will that puts you out of fellowship with Him, one sin or many. There's a second law of pardon. To repent of your sins, confess your sins, and pray God for forgiveness. I'm thankful to end every sermon with, if you're in sin, you don't have to be and you leave this building. You can be fully reconciled to God, in fellowship with Him, and all others who love the truth and obey it. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we ask you to come before we stand and sing.